some time for questions. Um, I might start by asking the first one and then I'll throw to the audience and don't forget to just state your name and organisation and, and keep your questions brief. Um, we're particularly interested in infrastructure and, and uh, the physical infrastructure elements that you talked about before and one of the great challenges for I think regional Australia is getting past that ever present, ever important CBA, the cost benefit analysis, because the populace doesn't support some of the major infrastructure developments that you need to connect your regional communities up to major cities, for example, where you've got patronage to support that. So I was wondering whether you might make a few comments. We're very interested in uh, seeing Infrastructure Australia, for example, uh, develop a methodology to broaden that cost benefit analysis. So you're looking at the agglomerated benefits of infrastructure, but also to stretch out those timeframes. Because if you look at the Harbour Bridge, which is the often cited and wonderful example of something that was built to over capacity in its day, but the long time frame means that certainly that it's come of age in terms of its uh, propensity to unleash productivity from the Australian economy and through Sydney, for example. Mm. Have you got any comments to make about that? I see I certainly do, and I couldn't agree more. If we just put our thinking around um, a cost-benefit analysis and leave it at that and don't look bigger picture, uh, again, including that vision you're talking about into the future, we're not going to get the right outcomes. I noted, noted the, the managing director of Toll, I think, said recently, if all we did was look through that prism, you'd never get investment in infrastructure. So, you, of course, you've got to take it on board, but it's part of a whole range of things, and I think a lot of it is about having the, the vision to think further than just the short term into what the long term benefits are going, going to be. But in terms of actually Infrastructure Australia having a look at broadening that, i um, very happy to have a chat to my colleagues about uh, how we might have a discussion around that. Yeah, I think it, it's, a, it's an important conundrum, mm -hmm. not just in Australia, but Australia is specifically uh, a impacted by it because of our geographical reach. Oh, very much so. And I think even telecommunications is a really good example mm. because you see where, where the, the, the private telcos will only go so far when you're pushing out in the regions. The more, the more remote you get, the more you're going to get market failure, the more it becomes a social good to deliver. So where does government sit in all of that? And, mm. and I think the mobile phone black spots program is a really good example of doing that and also the way we've structured the NBN regional rural delivery as well. Questions from the floor? Put one up the back there. Thank you very much, um, Minister uh, Matt Granger from the Bunbury Wellington Economic Alliance in the southwest of Western Australia. Um, I'm just fascinated from a distance to follow the progress of the, I think, the Wellcamp privately funded airport in the Toowoomba area of Queensland. I hope I've got that correct. Uh, there was a, quite a significant feature in the Australian newspaper yesterday. Um, and as, we, as I understand it, that's, that's all private, private funding that's gone into that. Um, does that not revolutionise an approach to, potential approach to infrastructure investment whereby presumably you can focus on unlocking private capital to, um, <laughs> to make those sort of significant investments and, and what, what what are your thoughts and your, what's your response to that, that sort of opportunity yeah. in relation to um, establishing and growing infrastructure assets? Thank, thanks very much for that. Look, I think it is a great example of, of seeing Australians being prepared to get off their tail and absolutely have a crack and really see what you can do uh, just in terms of private investment and not having people with a hand out to the government. What I think is tremendous about what they've done is it's really, it's really trailblazed the way that it, that it can be done. And I know they're even looking at, at other regional communities and the eastern seaboard. What it takes, I think, and this is really important, is if we're going to get private investment, there has to be confidence. So within the private, within the private sector itself, we've got to create a culture that regional Australia is a place to invest, that, it, that they can have the confidence to do it, that they will, there will be those returns. So to do, to do that, when you look at um, organisations uh, like, like theirs and what we've seen at, uh, at Toowoomba with the airport there, part, I see part of our role as government is to make sure that, that we're breeding that confidence, that business is prepared to put their hand up and invest in the regions 
and this is part of what I've been saying now since I've been Minister for Regional Development. If we constantly talk about the negatives in regional communities, as so often you, you see through the media, then that's the impression people get. And how on earth are people going to be prepared to have the confidence to invest if we're telling them that regional Australia is going down the gurgler? It's actually not. It's going really well. There are challenges, of course, in some places, uh, but a lot of it is about getting the message out there that regional Australia is a great place to invest in. It doesn't just you know, survive on government grants. And we've got terrific people like the Wagners who are prepared to invest and lead the way. Another question over the side here, I think. Oh, in the centre. Uh, Minister James Baker from Boeing. Hello, James Baker from Boeing. Minister. Nice um, to see you. Thank you, and likewise. Um, Sir Humphrey Appleby taught us that we should never ask a question that we don't know the answer to. So, um, given that if you've you know asked, the answer to this, James, don't ask it. <laughs> you, um, you've asked the question about decentralisation of government mm. departments. What does success look like? Do you think um, at, at the end of this process? James, that is a really good question. Simply, more of those entities, parts of departments, agencies out in the regions that currently are there. So in, in simplistic terms, a measurement that increases how many are there at the moment. But I think it's much bigger than that because what it actually says, and coming back to this confidence issue, it says, we're saying, we're saying to regional Australia that you deserve just as much as City Capitals or Canberra having the benefit of, of, the, of the public sector, uh, the public sector decentralised. You deserve just as much to have those opportunities, those career opportunities for your young people as people in Canberra and Sydney and Melbourne. So as well as obvious just the, the increase in terms of those agencies or entities that might end out there, the measurement for success for me will also be what it does for the psyche of those regional communities who believe in enough in themselves to be able to take on these entities, run with them and drive their futures as, as part of that. Now, clearly, they're not going to go everywhere and clearly we're not going to move policy entities out. You know, obviously, they've got to have a, have a connect to ministers, to government, as you well know, and, and other departments. But there are obviously going to be some that can be moved and why not? Why not? Regional Australia is a great place to be. And the other, the other measure of success that I'll use, and a couple of times people have said to me, well, what incentives are you going to give you know, entities to move out to the regions? And I say, moving to the regions is the incentive itself. We've got cheaper rates, cheaper rents, we've got fabulous lifestyle, we've got everything on offer out in the regions that you could possibly want to bring up a young family. The, the person down the road's gonna bring your dog back and when you get a flat tire, someone's gonna help you. Uh, so I sort of take umbrage at people saying, well, there need to be incentive to get out there because regional Australia is the best place to be. Question up the back. Um. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, loan clapper. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, Patience Harrington, CEO of the City of Wodonga in North East Victoria, and I first of all want to thank you for some of your initiative and support in seeing some great opportunities in our region. But so, Sorry, it was just with the lights, I can't see where you are, sorry. Oh, great, thank you. Um, fantastic opportunities in uh, both Wodonga and Albury, in those two cities becoming strategically engaged and I'm proud to be part of a council now that sees a great future in that alliance. But I just want to ask you, Senator, about the leadership of federal government in bringing what is two states to the same table, um, where at times uh, our economic development is really inhibited because of two states differing legislation. And I think a small example is um, taxi drivers in either state can't actually pick up customers in either state. They can deliver them over the border, but um, you know, the, in terms of our businesses and our economies, there's many, many inhibitors. But uh, really looking to the positive, what, what sort of leadership can the federal government offer the two states and certainly the two local governments in achieving what, what our potential should be? Patience, thanks for that. It is a, um, that taxi issue, that's bonkers, isn't it? Um, the, it, it's a long-standing and vexed issue. Um, there's no doubt about that. We've got it in the north of New South Wales as well, of course, around the Tweed and the, and the similar sort of border issues, border issues up there. Look, from the, from the federal perspective, I think a lot of our role is, is how do we get 
when so many of these decisions, I'm not passing the buck, it's just a fact, when so many of the things that you're referring to are actually state issue, uh, state issues, I think a lot of our responsibility is, is how do we encourage the states to work together to get that harmonisation? Because we're never going to be able to iron it out completely while we've got you know, the federation that we've got. But within the constraints of what we can do, I, I think we've got a leadership role to, to bring together, if you like, those, those, those states on either side of the borders, be they Victoria, New South Wales, or New South Wales and Queensland, in what barriers can be taken away and what better alignment can you have. Other questions from the audience? Down the front, Paul. Down the front with the microphone. Paul. Down to Paul. I'm normally silent. Uh, Paul McClintock from CEDAR, and uh, thank you for being part of this, Minister. Uh, uh, the question I had was, um, and it crosses again over state boundaries, but. Uh, but the mining industry and the view of regional communities towards that industry. Uh, mm. uh, we're finding now that in a lot of national uh, issues like energy and so on, uh, the relationship between the mining industry and regional Australia, which has always been so close, mm. seems to now uh, have an edge to it and perhaps isn't working as well. And I was wondering, yeah. you must be a great observer of this. Do you have any advice for us? Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm not sure about advice. I've probably got some observations. Uh, interestingly, I've got two boys, uh, and one, uh, both, one just about finished their degree, the other one finished. One did agriculture and business, the other one did mining engineering. Uh, I've got one and a half of them both home on the farm now. My elder boy who's doing his mining engineering is combining farming and mining. So at home, we've sort of even got that straddle just, just within, within my boys. There is ever increasing focus going on this and the more that we talk about energy and the challenges around there, the more we obviously come to issues around mining and particularly things like gas and CSG. My observation is, is there needs to be some balance and there needs to be common sense and practicality in it. My view is very much, of course, that we don't want to impact aquifers and we don't want to ruin prime ag farming land. But outside of that, there where mining is appropriate, of course it should go ahead. It should absolutely, in my view, be, be going ahead. So it's about getting the balance right, and I think it comes a bit, Paul, back to what I was saying earlier. Of, of, there's often not a one-size-fits-all approach to how, how we look at the regions and what we're doing there. So, so what, works, what works out in you know, Western New South Wales and in Western Queensland may not work on the Liverpool Plains. And, and what works in central Victoria may not work up in the, the centre of the Northern Territory. So it's about, I think, having the pragmatism to approach these things in a really balanced way, look after the environment, which of course we want to do, but make sure that we take advantage of the opportunities where they, where they exist. And I think have a real recognition that, that mining has a place, but as we evolve into the future, we've just got to make smart decisions about how we do that. Got time for a couple more questions, one down here. Um, I'll be loud. It's, the <laughs> microphone's just coming to you. Okay, hi. Uh, hi. It's it on. is on. Yep. Hi, uh, Minister, thanks for coming down to Bunbury and Margaret River in the southwest, the first minister to visit us down there. Oh, um, my pleasure. The question I was going to ask was about, you're talking about decentralising um, parts of government, but I wonder if you can decentralise the staff or at least make some of the people, I've dealt with third generation public servants who've got no bloody idea what it's like outside the leafy suburbs of Canberra, what the real world looks like, and perhaps there's almost a ceiling on their careers mm. until you've actually done some regional service or worked in the private sector. Mm. Um, is there a way to perhaps do that? <laughs> oh, there, there, there is indeed. The great thing about decentralisation, when you're you know, shifting these entities out there, people have to go with them. Uh, so we will obviously see that, that people shift. You raise a really good point, though, and there was some work done, I think, in UK or Canada that I was reading recently, and it's about this issue of where we have got public servants just corralled in the cities, that we end up not having the appropriate 
um, the, the appropriate wash put over policy, if you like, because they don't have this understanding of the regions. And you have to be able to, to, be able to balance them. So the, the work that I was reading was, was showing how important it is to make sure that we have, you know, at least a percentage of the public sector in the regions or at least understanding the regions, otherwise you end up with this very, and it's not having a go at the public, public servants in the cities at all, but it's just as an observation. You, get, you can get a very insular approach to, to policy thinking about when we're looking nationally, if we're only looking through the prism of, of capital cities. So um, I think, yes, the more people get out to the bush, the, the more they understand it, because it is different. People out in the regions are different and uh, they often have a different approach, which is great. It just brings into the, the melting pot of, of excellent policy thinking about where we want the nation to go. We've got time for one last question. I, I have one, if, if there's no one from the audience forthcoming. You spoke of, a lot about getting the cities out to the regions, about decentralisation, but I'm wondering whether there's uh, an opportunity for uh, us to bring the regions into the city as well. Uh, one of the things that we know is the great benefits of innovation are going to only be realised through real collaboration. And one of the things that you get in the noise of big cities is unfortunately, whilst the benefits of agglomeration are, are much cited, you often get a lot of siloed thinking in, in cities. And we saw that, for example, in the debate that we had earlier on today about university versus TAFE education and the disconnect between school and TAFE and university. But in some of the regions, you see these fantastic collaborations occurring, which are unleashing this huge potential of innovation in, through the regions. So I'm wondering whether there's, in fact, opportunities for uh, the regions to come to the city to tell the story of how they break down those barriers to unleash that productivity. I think that's a terrific idea. And you could, you could look at it through a couple of separate prisms, I think. One is... Um, obviously within, within the business sector and out in the regions and what's happening out there. And uh, what do they say? It's the necessity is the mother, the mother of invention or what that is, yeah. Um, that, that regional people do this because they have to. Exactly the sort of things you're talking about where you have to work together and they collectively pull together to, to come up with an initiative that they then have to drive. Often there's no alternative but to collectively work together. So bringing that in, how you do it, I mean, that's something that perhaps you can do some thinking around here about what would be the vehicle to bring that in. On another level too as well, I think it's also reaching out young people in the cities at a young age about what regional Australia is really like. So they're not just getting what's on the front page of the paper. And because times have changed so much, I can remember when I was younger at school, very long time ago now, um, that, that everyone seemed to, not everyone, but a number of people had an aunt or an uncle that had a farm somewhere that they would go and visit every now and then and visit Uncle Bob and Auntie Mary. That doesn't happen so much anymore, so we haven't got that, that immediate connect. So one of the other things um, I think we need to potentially consider is at that school level, how do we bring regional Australia into the cities? And, and I often look at the, the school groups we have coming down through here, you know, they come down, they do their trip to Parliament House. Maybe we need some sort of thing where regional Australia goes to the cities. Or an annual trip to regional Australia alongside your annual trip to Canberra. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings this session to a close. Thank you so very much, uh, Senator, for being with us today. It was a wonderful presentation, a great conversation. Uh, and would you please join me before we head down to lunch to thank the Honourable Senator Fiona Nash.